And this I wanted conference to conference will now be recorded. I wanted to start by saying that I hope everybody's healthy and safe and where possible staying home. Um, for any of you who are yourselves or who have loved ones who are on the front lines as healthcare workers or are providing other essential services, thank you for the role you're playing in keeping all of us safe. Um, I'm currently talking to you from my house in Toronto, where I have been uh, for the last six weeks. Um, I'm pleased to be joined by a really impressive group of three panelists today, who I'm sure you'll all enjoy spending the next hour with. I want to give you a brief introduction to the three of them before we dive straight into some uh, content. So first we have Dr. Katrin Imhoff. She is the Chief Program Officer for Right to Play International. Uh, I think Katrin's experience, which I'll talk about in just a second, uh, makes her a particularly insightful panelist today. She's spent most of her career working on ensuring education in some of the world's worst crises. Uh, I actually pinged her last night and I said, Katrin, I have to introduce you. I know you've been in a lot of the, the, the messy situations around the world over the last 20 years. Can you just remind me? Um, and, and I was surprised when I was reminded she was on the ground during the wars in Libya. Three months after 9-11, she was on the ground in Afghanistan, ensuring kids were learning there. Um, natural disasters, she was on the ground in Haiti after the earthquake, Thailand after the tsunami, Iran after the BAM earthquake. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that, that Katrin really is a global expert on education in emergencies. Uh, and I think her insight will be particularly interesting uh, given the current crisis that we find ourselves in. Our second guest, Lawrence Ofai, is a training officer, right to play training officer from Ghana. He is a lifelong educator. He has 20 years of experience as a teacher, curriculum developer, and teacher trainer in Ghana. He's currently one of our global all-star trainers right now, so he is training teachers across Ghana on behalf of um, Right to Play, and he's going to give us a view from the ground. He's going to be able to tell us exactly what's happening in Ghana and what does that mean for kids they're learning um, and, and, and how that's happening in this remote home-based environment. We have a very special guest as well um, from the LEGO Foundation, Dr. Bo Stern Thompson. He's the Vice President and Chair of Learning Through Play at the LEGO Foundation, but was one of the world's leading thinkers and researchers on how children develop creativity and learn through play. bo has been a visiting scholar and advisor at some of the world's top universities, including MIT, University of Cambridge, Tsinghua University, China's most prestigious university. Um, and as I mentioned, he is he's a chair at the Lego Foundation, which is one of the world's leading foundations supporting children's education and also a long time and important partner of Right to Play. You won't be surprised to uh, learn that the mission of the Lego Foundation and Right to Play are almost perfectly aligned. Um, and in fact, everything comes together because we are currently engaged in a very large project together in Ghana. Um, training teachers uh, in learning through play, playful approaches to learning uh, across the country. So uh, thank you to the panelists for joining us today. Um, and now I, I want to switch gears and really get into the heart of this. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic is having a tremendous impact on all of us. I think it's fair to say none of us really knows what the future holds. Given all of this change, we wanted to take the opportunity to invite you on the call today, our donors, our supporters, into a conversation about what the impact of COVID-19 is, the impact it's having on our populations, and how it's impacting our programs, and how Right to Play is addressing the crisis. We're going to do some content up at the front, so there'll be a bit of a Q&A between myself and the panelists, but hopefully the most exciting part will be the Q&A at the end. So as you're listening, we'd really like folks to start to formulate your questions, which you'll be able to send in and have our panelists um, answer. For anyone who's been to a Right to Play program, I've been to many of them, um, if you're in a Right to Play class, active, it's experiential, kids are full of questions. So hopefully we can make this session just like a Right to Play classroom, and we'd love to get your engagement after we do a little bit of content here at the front end. So, so let's get started. Katrina, I'm actually going to start with you. Um, and I'd like to ask you to share a little bit about what you're hearing in terms of the impact of this crisis 
in the places where right to play works around the globe. Hi everybody, I hope you can see me. I had a bit of problem, a technical problem. Um, can you see my camera on? Yeah, I can see you, Katrin. Oh, great, great. I'm yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, then I think uh, everybody can. So, um, hi everybody, and I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be here uh, because obviously we are in the middle of this uh, crisis with a lot of action. Um, and I want to start a little bit of a quick summary or like information sharing also about where we work. I mean, most of you on the call know that Right to Play is working presently with 15 uh, partner countries in Africa, the Middle East and Asia. And we also work in 52 refugee camps in, in, in all these three regions. So obviously our insights uh, come from very many different contexts and places. And uh, overall, we reach over 2 million children every year, and we also change the lives of, the, of these children, as for example, the life of Aisha in Pakistan, one of the girls in our partner schools, where children's mental health and academic performance improved thanks to right to play support using play as the methodology for learning. But let me come back first to the situation you were asking me where the children are in now, uh, including Aisha in, in Pakistan. Uh, there are very different contexts where in the countries we work and uh, we have still some commonalities. As many of us know, no matter where we sit, uh, we have seen countries um, locking down uh, nationwide or partially. Uh, children are out of school and in our countries they are out, on, out of school in all the uh, countries with the exception of Burundi where the government has taken a stand that they would like to keep uh, schools going. And uh, our, the children we work with uh, in, in those communities are uh, living in very precarious uh, contexts uh, that is related, for example, to healthcare. Uh, we know um, in many countries in Africa, especially, uh, but talking about Pakistan uh, as well in, in, in Pakistan, in, in more remote and rural areas, there is a very bad healthcare system. Uh, we have a lot of countries in Africa, for example, where there is no ventilators. Uh, in Mali, for example, where we have uh, large education and child protection programs, there are only three ventilators for a population of 20 million people. Uh, so we can imagine what that means for the children and the families living there. Um, obviously, everything much worse in rural uh, than in urban areas when it comes to access uh, to such services. And the attention now on this COVID-19 crisis multiplies also risks of other health issues such as HIV, malaria, all important aspects that got full or a lot of attention, but because now um, the health system is, is busy other ways, ways uh, this attention and services are no longer provided for such um, other cases like HIV or malaria affected. We also have very high population densities. Uh, we work in, uh, in rural areas, but we also work in urban, very poor areas. Uh, in refugee camps where the, a lot of people obviously on a very in a very close space live together and the virus has there a great potential to actually immediately um, spread and affect a lot of uh, people. Uh, last but not least, economic realities are very difficult to manage. Uh, we have in most of our countries, we have a lot of uh, families that need to go out every day so that they can make a living. So a lockdown in many of the counties and communities we work doesn't really um, help um, families to survive necessarily, or it could even have be the opposite. Uh, and the poorest people have no savings. They really need to go out every day to earn their living. And many of them work in informal businesses. That's uh, actually the the, the area where there is very little subsidies, they really don't have any support from the government to keep their businesses uh, going. They need to go every day and sell their goods at markets. So you can imagine what this means uh, for a girl like Aisha uh, in a rural setting in Pakistan or for the many other vulnerable children we serve in our partner countries. So we foresee that this crisis is, is hitting the poorest and most vulnerable children and family most and they're most exposed to this crisis and, and will uh, many weeks, months, and probably years uh, suffer from this. Thanks, Katrin, for that 
global overview of, of the impact on, on the children that Right to Play serves. Now we're going to really zone in and focus on one of the countries. And so, Lawrence, I'd like to turn to you and just ask about Ghana. What's the reality right now in Ghana and, and how has life changed because of the COVID crisis? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm happy to be joining this platform. Uh, it's good afternoon here and uh, uh, reaching you from Ghana, uh, precisely Accra. Um, it's been business as usual in Ghana until the 12th of March when Ghana recorded its first case of COVID-19. It was all panic across the country. Government moved in to put in place some measures to curb the spread. Um, this included cutting or canceling all flights and closing our borders and then also closing down schools, uh, restricting social gatherings to up to 25, and also implementing some uh, World Health Organization uh, protocols, safety protocols. Now, to put it into perspective, uh, Ghana has a total population of about 30 million spread across 16 uh, regions. And just as our educational sector, we have challenges also in the health sector, ranging from the uh, the ratio, uh, doctor patient ratio, availability of hospitals, beds, ventilators, these are all issues that confront the health sector. As we speak, Ghana is first in West Africa with the highest uh, cases of COVID 19, uh, with almost about uh, more than 2,000 cases, and then also one of the highest in Africa. If you're looking at the African countries that have the highest numbers, Ghana is one. And it is surprising because looking at the population compared to a country like Nigeria, which has about 250 million people. So this is really a, a, an issue for Ghana. And people have even doubted this number. And considering the population and the nature of our communities, it's expected that this number is going to be growing exponentially. Now, this has brought a lot of challenges. COVID-19, the pandemic has brought a lot of challenges to us, it has come with its own form of challenges. First and foremost is the misinformation. The message about COVID-19 is not reaching every area, every cruise and canyon of Ghana. And so particularly people who don't have access to electricity, people who don't have access to television or online platforms where they could access information are really living by the myths and the things that they believe in. And so people are, we're preparing all forms of concussions and drinking it in an attempt to prevent it. We have people who even doubt the existence of the, uh, the, 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 the virus or the, the disease in Ghana. In addition, with the closure of schools, most of the children are seen loitering around. Others also have to replace their parents at workplaces, particularly because we do a lot of uh, informal businesses. Some are enjoy engaging the children in their house chores and then the farm and all other activities. And then lastly, we are realizing that one of the biggest challenge COVID-19 has brought to our children is the issue with learning. With schools closed, government actually instituted um, a platform to provide learning to children virtually. But unfortunately, looking at our circumstances where people and most of our rural areas don't have access to some of these uh, strategies or systems that would let them assess the online platforms to learn. It has left our children with nothing, nothing to learn. And so the only option is to engage in the deviancy or engaging or following their families in doing their everyday business. And for some of the parents, it is good time to do business with their kids, carry them to the farms, engage them in other activities. And that is what the, the, the case has been in Ghana as we speak. But thankfully, we have some uh, measures, uh, we've put in some measures to as a stopgap, which I'll be sharing later uh, if I have the opportunity to come back on this platform. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, so I think both Katrina and Lawrence have given us a really good assessment of, of the contexts where we work and the realities, uh, specifically as they re relate to children's learning. Katrin, can you talk to us about how Right to Play is strategically pivoting its programs to respond to these COVID realities? Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Um, it was an interesting approach, actually, and, and, uh, and a couple of interesting steps we had to take. 
uh, we looked at uh, we assessed the program where we are having strengths and uh, what activities we are uh, intending to do looking forward going forward and we have decided to structure it in three phases one is the response phase from, from let's say uh, first to third month then we have a recovery phase about four to nine months and the nine to 12 months longer term approach and we think that we have already outlined the, the whole almost year to come with a very intense response now in the first one to three months and uh, as i said we have been looking into the activities and the approaches we are strong at and we had experience before we have been working during the ebola crisis in Liberia, we had uh, several um, programs um, around preventive measures and, and stay for staying healthy. Uh, so we have uh, set up a framework with, through which we are presently reaching 600,000 children. So we are already um, out there with preventive hand washing and social distancing activities. Uh, we are also supporting families um, where children are staying at home with psychosocial support, which means social emotional learning and, and stability and norma normalcy and, and life skills uh, as well, while we are also continuing learning with children um, so that they are not missing too much of their content when they are going back to schools. Uh, we are working with a lot of partners, uh, several partners uh, and platforms uh, to reach children at home through technologies, I mean through adults and technologies, uh, to reach teachers and coaches directly that they can keep working um, with, with, with children, government partners and also civil society organization partners. And our reach is, is mainly going through paper as the, as the traditional way of, of in many ways where technology access is difficult but a lot also through radio and tv uh, messengers uh, social media as well i want to give you a couple of examples of what countries uh, country teams do to reach children for example in tanzania we have reached uh, more than 33,000 children through messages on leaflets uh, or through uh, microphones, megaphones in communities, and also through distance, uh, social distancing observed activities. Uh, we also have developed a radio drama uh, for to empower girls. Thailand, for example, uses individual guidance, I mean, individual reading guidance uh, for at home um, activities. Uganda has developed a program on radio uh, talk shows uh, on hygiene on how best to wash the hands how to stay healthy and is also now moving into literacy and numeracy um, topics jordan has developed uh, physical activity videos that are presently now while we are speaking are distributed uh, on a ministry of education and national tv platform uh, that covers actually physical activities we all know how important physical activities are in this time of lockdowns as well for all the grades between 1 and 12. And Mozambique um, is also working with the Ministry um, of, of Education to run a literacy uh, program that also goes through video. So you see there is a lot of activities uh, going on with a lot of different uh, methodologies being used. What all have uh, in common is they are all using play-based learning, playful learning activities and uh, so have uh, a, a, a reach um, that actually goes to the regular program activities would be uh, like the audience we normally have, but also uh, far beyond that. Thanks, Katrin. Uh, yeah, I remember it was, I think it was five weeks ago, one of my colleagues at Right to Play, I actually joined Right to Play in 2015, Ebola was 2014 in West Africa, and they forwarded me a manual. I thought social distancing was kind of a new term. I hadn't really heard about it until um, until this crisis, this corona crisis. And then as I flipped through our manual of games for teachers and parents, there was an entire chapter called social distancing with 10 different games to play with children to teach them about social distancing. And right before that chapter was a chapter about hand washing. So, so this is something that we've been doing for a very, very long time. Our hand washing games with children actually go back all the way 20 years. Um, I'm actually going to switch over now to you, Bo. Um, the Lego Foundation is one of the, the most important foundations globally supporting children's learning. 
Uh, and I'd like to know how the Lego Foundation is responding to the COVID crisis. Um, and then maybe to ask you about the immediate uh, and indirect impacts on kids as a result of the crisis that you're seeing or hearing about from other Lego partners, because you are you support so many of the, the big actors in, in this space. Thank you, Kevin. And, um, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, it, it's really amazing to hear about the work you're doing, uh, in particular, the urgency in the situation in right now. So um, one of the fundamental things we realized in the foundation was that we quickly had to turn around all of our activities, basically, and uh, develop an emergency fund, uh, which supported our partners and created practical advice for, for parents and teachers. So basically, we have paused the majority of our activities or initiatives and created five action streams. And that's where we operate in right now to focus on supporting partners with flexibility and pulling together resources uh, for parents and teachers. And we know that as we as we're getting insights from from our, our work that that of course this would have impact at least uh, six to twelve months uh, delay maybe even longer but what seems to be most interesting is actually that that there is such a great need to cover right now and there's such an opportunity to innovate in the way we approach things right now so so that's what we're doing right now we're really trying to to flip things around and and, and do faster streams in our work when we look at the implications for, for children, we are also consolidating some large scale surveys and follow up discussions right now across several countries. And, and the, the, the first thing to say is that the situation looks extremely different in, in different parts of the uh, world and communities. So on the one hand, you have one child in a family where both of their parents are losing their jobs or they have an extremely uh, difficulty in adapting their current jobs and working conditions, they have low resources, they have no materials, they have lack of knowledge, and, and they have to maintain a practice of learning at home. And I think the examples that were just coming from Catherine and Lawrence are, are really illustrating that. That is a huge setback with long-term implications. On the other end, you also have families where parents are having opportunities to do flexible work remotely. They have very strong supporting uh, workplaces. Uh, they might have rich, stimulating environments at home, and they have some 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 knowledge and and, and time to engage in learning. It's still difficult because uh, children are missing their friends, and it is on a distance, uh, and there are still high expectations on learning. But I think the crisis in itself is an eye opener on that kind of inequality in terms of what to do and how we provide the best uh, for children. So when we look at the general picture of this crisis and look at the policy insights we are giving right now, it it's a devastating crisis because it combines the well-being, the uh, learning aspects, and the general economy aspects on, on these uh, three uh, issues. So children living in poverty right now is just being escalating with a significant impact on, a, on the social, emotional, and physical health, and is escalating the learning crisis where now uh, what the current estimate is for 1.6 billion children out of school. Uh, where it's difficult for families to to equip them with, uh, at the home and and adapting new routines that you're saying but also the basic things of being uh, disconnected it is a physical disconnection it's not necessarily a social disconnection but but it's very difficult to maintain social networks caring interaction stability when, when children are isolated so so one needs, really needs to find new ways of adapting practices and, and connecting and then we don't really know you know when it's over it, it just flips in different uh, in different ways in different countries. So so there is some uncertainty to deal with for, for some time. Great, thanks, Bo. Um, really, really important for us to, to think about the social emotional well-being of, of children, like you said, and especially the differential impacts depending on which context they find themselves in. Um, and I see there's already some questions coming in, which is great. So if people want to get their questions queued up even early, Wan Ching from Germany's got a great question in there for Katrin, which we'll get to at the end. But thanks, Wan Ching, for that contribution of a question. Um, Lawrence, uh, can you now tell us really specifically, we've heard from Bo, we've heard from Katrin on, on broader kind of global levels aggregate levels about some of the impacts but can you take us zoom us right in on ghana what's happening with schools being closed and what's the plan right so uh basically what we've done is to look at what our challenges are as a result of the closures and all one of and we identified two two main issues first and foremost is the fact that there is some form of uh, panic as a result of the misinformation there is also some level of discomfort among children 
And so there's the need to step in. The second has to do with providing alternative learning opportunities for learning for children. And so to address this, we have really uh, collaborated with our coaches. And in order that they are also able to reach children in two ways, either online and then also direct. So these are the things we do. First and foremost is to provide psychosocial supports to children and families using games and activities. Now these games have been structured along our global um, framework as to keeping children active, keeping them healthy, how to protect themselves and others and keeping active at home. And so these activities have been selected where parents could engage with their children with the support of the coaches who we have provided uh, with PPEs, i.e. Uh, sanitizers, gloves, so that they could easily move into communities. And they are moving into communities that are within areas where they also live. The second thing is to provide them, for, provide families with supplemental learning materials. We're looking at storybooks, workbooks, and other learning materials where they engage or initiate the process of engaging the children to learn, and parents are motivated to carry on and support their children to learn. There is a system where we are encouraging those who have phones that will support sharing of information to be shared with teachers, and teachers will do follow-up activities with parents by sharing the feedback and others of work that children have done with the, 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 the coaches and teachers or volunteer teachers who are on the field. The next thing has to do with one challenge we've had. We had to do with the washing of hands and keeping safe. One of the biggest challenges we have, particularly in the dry season, is the fact that many, many of our communities lack portable water. People have to travel distance to be able to access drinking water. In fact, sometimes this water is not even safe for drinking, but they, they really have to use it. And so in order that they are able to dedicate themselves to washing their hands and practicing uh, hand washing, in the midst of our games and our activities that they engage in, we also support through our coaches and uh, teachers to support parents to establish what we call TP tabs, to really make sure that there is always water dedicated to washing hands. And to make it really work, we are also supporting homes and children, families with cakes of soap, antiseptic uh, soap, so that this thing, they are motivated to be able to do practice hand washing uh, quite often. So basically, these are the things we are doing. We acknowledge that not all of them will have access to online programs. So in addition to the others who can have access to the online games and activities that we are doing, we are also reaching out to those who don't have access to some of these uh, uh, techniques or what we call technology to be able to access online programs. Great, thanks, Lawrence. Uh, and yeah. Right to Play you know, has 20 years of experience using play to help children both acquire knowledge but change their behavior whether that be using mosquito nets in in uh properly in uganda um whether that be uh, teaching children how to use condoms correctly to protect themselves from disease and now this is literally life-saving uh behavior change to be able to teach children in these communities about how to wash their hands properly effectively and then how to stay social distanced um, so, so thanks for, for uh, bringing us up to speed on that and also telling us a little bit about um, how we're bringing water and, and soap to some of these communities to make sure that that's possible. Katrin, so that's, that's Ghana that we've heard about from Lawrence. Can you tell us, are we seeing anything else on the ground in other countries that it, that it's, um, that it might be useful for, for the group on the phone to hear about? Um, yeah, I, um, I mean, we have a lot of uh, examples uh, that, uh, that, yeah, that I, I, I did share in the, in the previous um, comments. And um, I think what makes it common is that we have been very creative and innovative in uh, the way of uh, how we build on existing programs. Ghana had, for example, a very strong um, water and sanitation program and a very strong change of behavior program and has been success successfully uh, building on this. And in, in, in Tanzania, for example, uh, we build also on messaging, on the, uh, the drama that I have been mentioning is uh, really built around messaging about early marriage, gender issues, child protection issues to um, avoid uh, that the possible abuse uh, of children or towards children or violence against children is, is, is becoming less and, and, and very hopefully not more because of this crisis. So there, there is a lot of um, additional aspects we have been 
complementing to really do this change and to keep change behavior going for the present crisis and also beyond in a more long-term vision. I'm happy to talk about a, a long-term, a little bit later, on how we then also connect this uh, good experience and build and replicate the good experience from these different countries. Great, thanks, Katrin. And I think this goes to Wan Ching's question um, as well, long-term. So why don't we just tackle it now? Um, Wan Ching was asking, uh, you know, that that you'd mentioned kind of a three-phase response, and and she was asking about what is the second stage, the recovery stage, and what does the, the third uh, stage look like? So what it, what do you foresee the challenges are for right to play long term uh, because of COVID and, and will that change our approach to programming? Yeah, that's actually an excellent uh, point and I think uh, something we should be all concerned about because we know that this uh, this crisis has long-term implications. And um, I would say also opportunities to learn and uh, to build our program uh, back in a better way. Uh, we are certainly, um, as I mentioned with the three phases, uh, where we have a response, a recovery, and a long-term, we are already looking ahead uh, a year from now. And we also are making ourselves ready for a possible second wave. Nobody knows um, when the vaccination will um, come through and if what the what a new wave would mean. But what we also know is that anything that has every or anything and everything that has already happened has already implications. Um, for now, I mean, talking about the next phase that we are um, approaching is this. Uh, so-called recovery phase for now if we are not hit by a second wave very soon and it means really preparing children and teachers to go back to school so it means to have teachers uh, fa um, supported in uh, facilitating uh, the classroom interactions not only on an academic learning side but also on the psychosocial side social emotional going back to normalcy and um, probably have more material new material to use um, certainly the whole change behavior and information and education and communication approach needs to be maintained. Uh, we are also uh, building up and uh, preparing catch-up classes for accelerated learning. A lot of this is concerned around literacy and numeracy, and a lot of it is actually a right to play contribution to a much bigger picture because we work with government partners and partners like the UN or other NGOs or civil societies our interventions are actually really reaching um, scale um, where we manage to connect with, with those systems and in, in literacy and numeracy it seems to move towards the right direction there is a big need and we have a big uh, a great uh, tool and opportunities and approaches to uh, learn to have children more in a more playful way learn um, reading and uh, and also calculating uh, auto recovery actions, and that's probably the interesting part, is to combine now our response actions that are um, structured around the same framework with activities that are already ongoing. We have heard how Ghana has actually built on activities activities that are, that are already ongoing. Um, we have examples of disease prevention, we have hygiene, we have water and sanitation uh, programs that are running, that are the ideal entry point now to combine uh, response and recovery. The same for child protection. We know that um, abuses are most probably going up, uh, like, uh, like for example, early marriage, um, child children engaged in, in hazardous child labor, and we are ready for that and are uh, building the programs uh, around this, and especially in countries, obviously, where we have also a good child protection base already. Um, then not to forget about the whole psychosocial support approach. We are not immediately back to normal. Children will need that support, and that's the third pillar um, um, in, this, in this framework. Um, last but not least, we make really, and that's why I was saying opportunities, we make really good experiences of remote learning. So we are planning to build this up to have more remote learning for teachers, um, like through animated e-learning tools, for social emotional skills, but also literacy and numeracy so that teachers can be uh, trained um, also through an e-learning approach in the future. And we are also uh, 
replicating good experience with radio and TV. We have also good experience from other programs like innovations that happened before COVID-19, like um, our TV show in Lebanon, where we reach 5 million uh, children in 41 countries. And we are really uh, aiming at uh, doing this better and having uh, even a higher reach, while also re achieving these results for children. That means actually changes in their lives. Great, thanks, Katrin. Um, and I think there was a follow-up question from Sue at Stars Group, which we'll get to at the end. But I'll just let you know, Katrin, because I think it tacks on to what you were just saying. Uh, Sue and Stars Group, another awesome supporter of Right to Play, longtime the supporter uh, of ours, a great partner from the UK, uh, is asking how Right to Play will approach the new normal post-lockdown, in particular, ensuring that children return to Right to Play programs. We've heard a lot that you know, children who drop out of school, a significant percentage will not be returning to school in the countries where we work. And I think we're wondering about uh, children coming back to our program. So let's, let's circle back to that at the end, but I think it's very relevant to what you were just saying. Bo, I'm gonna come over to you now. I'm also gonna tell everyone on the call, if you have a niece and nephew, a son or a daughter, you definitely need to subscribe to Bo's Twitter feed. It's one of my favorites because on a daily basis, you get really thought-provoking, world-leading research on how children learn, the best ways to engage children, um, and some really, really practical examples that you can use with your kids. I know I do. Um, so definitely check out Bo on Twitter. Um, and, and Bo, the reason I, I say that is because the question I'm about to ask you is just some general advice. And this isn't about being in the global north or the global south. Uh, can you give us general advice? You're a world leading expert on how children learn through play. Uh, advice on how to keep kids safe and engaged during this coronavirus crisis. Uh, and how can parents and caregivers continue to support learning through play for, for their children? Yes, definitely. Uh, and thank you for pointing to, to the general advice. I think everyone are looking for things that are very practical at this point because they're sitting home, whether as a parent or as a teacher trying to engage in remote learning. But what you emphasize is actually quite important, two things about safety and engagement. And uh, as was illustrated by Catherine and Lawrence also, it is really important to mention that the physical and social and emotional well-being is not separate from how we think about learning. Because playing is ideally suited to address both aspects, both on the short term, you know, you really enjoy being around things where you can test and try out, be actually engaged, and you learn a great deal of skills and knowledge uh, at the same time. So the two things that, that, that seems to be coming out of this session also that we say is, please remember that the well-being and social emotional is an absolutely critical starting point. And don't try to engage your children in any kind of traditional didactic learning activities if they're really feeling anxieties or stressed or, or they don't have the love and care and listening that, that, that they need. So spend time uh, having opportunities for them to express themselves in words, in painting, in drawing, in music, however they feel right now, and then engage in safe, responsive, stimulating interactions where you can have different forms of play, building things together, games, telling stories or, or creative activities. So that. That, that, that's just the basic starting point and that play is so ideally suited for it. But the second thing that, that people are often surprised about, particularly in, in the global movement around play, is that play is learning and, and tech does not need to be uh, all about the solution here. So when we think about learning, we usually think about worksheets or reading books or sitting at school discs. But, you know, and to minimize the effect of, of being on a distance from schools, we can do a lot with active forms of engagement. Basically moving around, as was mentioned also by Lawrence here, touching, manipulating things and everyday objects, that's counting, that's quantifying, that's sorting, that's testing and trying cause and effect. It's basically mathematics and science. You can start at the very simple things with, with building things to go into to, uh, to more abstract concepts and concepts of planting things and so forth. But also creating stories and, and reading to your children. So basic support for language and, and social interactions and engaging things like baking and cooking where you plan and, and, and do strategies. So there are some social emotional aspects where simple play activities, spending time together is important, but actually you actually learn also knowledge as part of these uh, activities. So play is definitely okay. And it's probably, as we've been writing around uh, and summarized in, in a few weeks, play is likely one of the most important things to do right now, not only to cope with change and manage our anxieties, but engage in deeper forms of learning 
and dream about what could be better. I think everyone are looking to getting back to normal, but please instill a positive mindset in yourself and with children that there is a better place after a crisis. You can see friends again, you can build where you want to go afterwards. Uh, so use that opportunity to, uh, to, to bring out the imagination also uh, as much as you can. Thanks, Bo. Um, and again, uh, the one thing I would say to anyone on this call who's, who's interested in diving deeper on this, you, you need to put a few hours aside, but if you get to Bo's Twitter feed, um, there is just, and you can go back and back and back weeks and even months, there's extraordinary resources there on how to use play to drive creativity um, and, and children's learning. So highly recommend it. Um, on the topic of play and music and how children learn, um, there's an awesome video uh, online from a few weeks ago from Ghana, actually, Lawrence. Um, kids singing about hand washing to prevent the spread of coronavirus. Uh, and we know that kids learn through play. They learn through repetition. They learn when they're enjoying themselves. They learn in social groups. Um, I got to forewarn everyone because I think we can share the link after this session. Um, my kids watched it and that's all they sang for about the next two weeks. Um, so if you do go there and you have kids, um, be forewarned that if they watch this video, you'll be hearing the coronavirus song for weeks after that. But Lawrence, can you tell us a little bit about that video and where it came from? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, it's awesome. And it's just one of the uh, very the, the many uh, innovations that our coaches and teachers are applying or are putting in place to make sure that they get to the core of getting the message to the children. Like you rightly said, children are learning through play. And so this teacher, uh, Duke, uh, actually came up with this song, composed it, and then engaged the children in doing, in, in practicing the kind of movement. And then it actually contains every message the children need to stay safe. Washing hands, making sure they keep social distance, and then not touching the face. These are all contained in the song, and it's in their local language. And one thing that is interesting is that you, you usually, find people in the working class learning with their kids or singing at home. But it is interesting, COVID-19 revealing more people in rural areas singing and having their own rendition of songs that these uh, children are singing. And for us, it is really amazing. And it comes to support many, many activities that the teachers and the coaches are doing on the field. Seeing parents getting interested in the videos and then seeing parents engaging their children in playing at home, which is usually very rare to find. And for us, it is one of the things that we are achieving under this uh, system or situation in which we find ourselves. Thanks, Lawrence. Great. So we're, we're, we're about to go to questions. Uh, you will get the video, I believe, in your email inbox as a follow up. So, so definitely take the link and, and check out the coronavirus song. Um, as a last question, I'm actually going to ask both Katrin and Bo quickly to just let anyone on the call know if they want resources because it's all fine to hear that learning through play is how children learn um, but if you don't know how to do it it can be a little bit scary and daunting as a parent or a caregiver so there's a ton of resources out there so Katrin maybe you could talk a little bit about where the right to play resources are and then Bo I don't know if you could give us a little advice on where the Lego because I know the Lego Foundation is a massive convener of this global knowledge where, where people could go for that. So Katrin to you first. Yeah, yeah so uh, from the right to play side we have uh, games resource uh, pages and, and our website and uh, this is frequently updated with new games every week. And we can, I mean, it includes different uh, games that um, we are using normally in our programs, but uh, are very, I would say, also accessible and useful for anyone who wants to use it, as you were mentioning the song, Kevin, also from Ghana. And for anything more, obviously, we are almost, uh, always ready to also share um, additional resources. We are presently uh, or very soon having more kind of interactive and um, yeah, games that uh, more games that we will be able to share. So please do not hesitate to contact us and we will um, provide you even with more details and more games than what you can find up on our website. Great. And Bo, any advice on resources? 
Yeah, I think that that's a kind of similar uh, response. So on our website, we have uh, not only the the blog post and and examples and so forth, uh, but uh, but also activities uh, to engage your children in. Uh, and then we are gradually now uh, developing and probably launching in the next week or so uh, a database where we curate different materials across mm -hmm. age groups and and uh, and competencies and so forth. So that's something we will be developing. We've seen that people want activities, but they also need the bigger curation and sorting of that. So that will include activities from our partner like the uh, Harvard Center of the Developing Child, Sesame Street, and so forth. But the starting point is uh, on the Lego Foundation website, the knowledge base uh, link there. Amazing. Um, so I think what we'll do is in the follow-up email, we'll, we'll provide a link to the Right to Play resources and also to the Lego resources for everyone who's on the call. Okay, so if you have any questions, definitely get them into the, the chat window now. Um, but before we go to questions, I just want to say thank you to everybody on this call. Um, many of our, our, our top global supporters are on this call, and it's only because of our incredible donors who've been so generous um, and accommodating during this difficult time that we're able to serve the children in the, in the most vulnerable parts of the world. Um, it's your support that enables us to continue to achieve our mission despite COVID, to keep kids protected, to keep them educated and to keep them empowered. Uh, so thank you for being there with us. Um, we're gonna continue to serve these children both during the crisis and afterwards as we heard. Um, we rely on our donors now more than ever it won't surprise you that fundraising is is a little bit tougher. We do a lot of event-based fundraising and, and events won't be happening because of COVID this year. So if anyone would like to support our work in this critical time, please do visit our website. Thank you for your past support and, and any future support. Um, really appreciate you also making the time today to just learn a little bit more about what we're doing. Um, so maybe that let's go to Sue's question um, first. And I'm wondering if Lawrence and Katrin, you might want to uh, talk about how Right to Play is going to approach the new normal um, and how we're going to make sure the kids don't drop off, that, that, that kids actually get back into school, they get back into our programs on the other side of this. Yeah, I will start and then maybe Lawrence uh, can give a, a, a bit more details what exactly happens in Ghana. Um, but just overall, uh, the guidance and the programs, how we build them, is uh, is based on our advantage that we are very close to the communities we work with. Um, we are working with coaches and teachers uh, in the education system. Many of these coaches are now teachers, um, but we, we have not changed our way of work with them. So we are um, very, very much connected with the communities and therefore also have a, a good insight in which what child, which child is actually at risk to not go back to school or to drop out. Uh, so we have tracking mechanisms with teachers that are following up also on children uh, if they're not coming back to school now or also in regular settings when they dropped out. Uh, we also use uh, play as a convener. We had in, uh, in Mozambique, we had a very uh, substantial uh, success of several thousand children uh, being enrolled again after a dropout while we were convening children in the communities by uh, through play and children would appear because this didn't seem to be boring anymore like they probably know the school and pro in, in many settings find uh, and probably are quite uh, boring uh, learning uh, approaches and this convener play has uh, really made uh, the access to those children much stronger. We know that actually from Ghana as well Lawrence maybe um, you, you can share a little bit more of that experience later where we uh, all children that were engaged in hazardous labors and begging on the streets um, going back to school because of the convener play. Uh, we also have child clubs in the different uh, schools and programs where children are advocating and tracking children there as well. So they know their colleagues, their friends are not in school and they are mobilizing themselves, uh, children to actually advocate with teachers if they are not doing the proper follow-up or even have uh, some set up activities that help uh, those children to go back in school to support them when it's sometimes also an economic issue. We always work very closely with partners 
and the Ministry of Education. So every support we provide, we always want it to be useful for the system so that it in the longer term can be replicated and uh, can also be used in communities we are not uh, working. Uh, and connected to this is also the whole structure of parents teachers associations which we are strengthening so that parents and teachers alike are very much engaged not only in access to education but also in, in increasing the quality of education which is another pull factor actually the better the education is the more attractive for children the more likely they want to come by themselves great thanks katrin we've got a question now from leslie in the uk uh, asking um, if either myself or you could talk a little bit about our programs in refugee camps. As we know, refugee camps are often constrained, so people can't go in or out. They're very dense. They have inadequate health care. Um, can you talk a little bit about, Katrin, our response in refugee camps? Because it's a very specific content with its own uh, context, with its own very specific difficulties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it has, uh, obviously, yes, the children are more at risk, I would say, because it's very dense, that it has a, a population that lives very closely together. On the other hand, uh, there is also more control of the disease spread in some ways. So in Thailand, for example, um, the camps, to, to work in camps was easier and to do our work with little risk and really having that flexibility then in the system where a whole lockdown of the country was was happening in some in some places like in Thailand it, uh, the camp was in an area where there was not um, uh, there, there was li very little risk and so that helped actually to have kind of this space that is not the regular <laughs> government space that allowed us to do actually uh, work in other cases we have uh, been we have worked on and used uh, past approaches. For example, in Palestine, we always had uh, problems um, to to enter Gaza. I mean, Gaza is not it, it's not in that sense a refugee camp, but it was a closed um, area where we always had to use always, already remote uh, ways of work. So we have actually been able to build on that and have been able to serve refugees or like in this case, population in Gaza, but the, the same practice was then um, also replicated in 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 refugee camps that um, had actually almost a stronger and better response in some ways because the systems um, can be used that are not necessarily only government systems. So it's the UN, it's UNRWA. We have used UNRWA platforms. Um, so the remote work was in some cases even uh, more easier. In some cases, the restrictions were not there because they were not necessary, and we could do our work. So um, in 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 many ways, uh, I would say we have been able to serve the refugee population um, in in. Yeah, almost as in a regular program. And in many other programs too, we have really been able to catch up. But in, in refugee situations, we have um, found opportunities to build on. Thanks, Katrin. A um, couple questions. I think there might be a new one here. Um, ah, Katrin, just a reminder on Wan Ching's question about working in three phases. I, did, I think you actually did cover that. I've just seen a, a little remark here. Um, so maybe two more questions, because I know we're going to run out of time real soon. Um, one was for Lawrence about how Right to Play is able to reach so many households, and how do you make sure that no child gets left behind in this crisis? And then Lawrence, after you answer that question, we'll go over to Bo, who we will give the last word. Um, and, and Bo, we'd like to hear from you. The question is that in the aftermath of COVID-19, what challenges do you foresee this interruption having on children's long-term learning? So first, Lawrence, how, how, do you, how are you getting to households in Ghana and how do you make sure no child gets left behind? And then over to Bo for the, the final word on the, on the long-term implications of an interruption to children's learning. Lawrence, you might be on mute. Thank you. Yes, to, before that, I want to share that um, Right to Place activities have pushed a lot of, have actually made a lot of these children to go to school. And we hope that through the activities that we are doing in the communities, where we are involving the teachers, the parents, and the children, we are not likely to leave any child behind. 
the, the, the bid about what we're doing, what will help exactly is the fact that we are using teachers in all the communities. Luckily for us, teachers who teach in our schools also live in the communities. And so the idea is that they are going to work to reach out to all the children that are there. And so for, for instance, in a school that we have about 12 teachers, all these teachers are on board and they are reaching out to the children. We have also made adequate uh, arrangement for enough materials, storybooks. We, we may not really have so much, but then at least to make sure we reach as many children as possible, where each of them will be able to have access to reading materials or they have access to some form of uh, work to be done using their workbooks. And so we can be sure that as many children who are really stuck in the communities right now are going to be engaged in learning more so to increase their interest in schooling and then not to create a gap where they may begin to develop some disinterest in returning to school after the COVID-19 crisis. Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, yeah. Okay, Bo, unless, and I mean, an, another question could pop up, but if it doesn't, then I think last question over to you about, about the implications of an interruption in learning like this uh, for kids. Thank you. Yeah, I think interruptions and challenges are, are very clear also from the conversation we had right now. I think uh, on, on, on the top level of things, um, you know, the current estimates on, on what happens to children's learning when they're not in school, for instance, uh, from now on and until uh, a little bit into the autumn is that people say you are 70% behind on math and 50% behind in reading. So there are something around basic things that children are learning. I think there's also people talk a lot about the growing tensions between national interests, local interests and international interests on how, who gets what, what to share and support. And then there's a supply chain uh, uh, challenge in terms of how we distribute uh, materials and so forth, which will continue for long in the case for children's learning. I think there are some opportunities just to, to close with, because I think what this has taught us also in our conversations also today is there are some skills that are more basic than others. And we can actually, begin to reposition that social, emotional, and creativity and adaptability are the ones that are most crucial and needed right now and more than ever. Like if you're not able to adapt and deal with these kind of uh, anxieties and resilience, uh, it's very difficult to be living in, 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 in the near future at least. And also that we need, secondly, to coordinate much more about our knowledge base on how effective learning practices work through active forms of learning blended forms of physical and online, because there are good practices, but be able to share that faster and, and, uh, and create the uh, chains in practice is, is important. And then I think the last thing I, I see here, uh, actually as an opportunity is that governments and corporates and non-governments coming together to address inequality, because it's hitting things and hitting children very differently around the world, where you have access to knowledge and materials and, and community support. So, so there are some opportunities, I think, that, that we can definitely talk on uh, and continue with later. Thanks, Bo. Um, and thanks for ending on a positive note, I think, for Right to Play as well. Um, there are opportunities out there. I was on a call this morning where we were looking at all of the different um, innovations that are coming out of this, because it's, it's not business as usual. So we're looking at new ways to reach children and parents, where typically we work with teachers at scale with the Ministry of Education. We've now pivoted and are getting to parents in all sorts of new and interesting channels, radio, TV, WhatsApp. So I think there's a, there is a lot of learning here and there are opportunities, especially in the most vulnerable context, for the world to figure out better ways to serve these children. So, so Right to Play will we'll continue to look for opportunities as well um, uh, through this crisis. Okay, so we're at time. Uh, I hope that everyone who joined found this a valuable use of their time. Uh, again, I wanna thank everyone on the call for their support of, of Right to Play and for their care for children, not just in their own backyard, but, but across oceans and across continents. Uh, as Bo said, there's very disproportionate effects depending on where you sit socioeconomically. And it's really important that the world steps up to support children who are out of school in some of these most vulnerable, least developed nations. So thank you. Please feel free to follow up with any of us on the email. Um, certainly we can get you connected with Lawrence in Ghana. Katrin, I know would be happy to connect, um, as would I uh, and Bo. We'll, we'll send the coronavirus song. Hopefully your house will be singing the coronavirus song within a couple of days. Um, and, and be well, be safe. 
and 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 thanks for for joining us today thank you kevin thank you everyone thank you bye everybody